Hello and welcome to the SAE Tomorrow Today podcast. I'm your host, Grayson Brulte. On today's podcast, we're absolutely honored to have Calvin Monroe, Senior Scientist Mobility, PPG Industries. Welcome to the podcast, Callum. No, oh, thank you very much for having me. Oh, you're very, very welcome. And I want to start off by saying this, paint is interesting and paint is cool. So I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Well, I certainly believe that. And I'm glad to hear that you're a believer too. <laughs> you grew up in a house with a deep appreciation for paint. Your father was a chemist who founded a coatings company. Your grandfather was a scientist. It seems to me that you were destined to work in the paint industry. Did your father and grandfather inspire you to get into the family business? Uh, they certainly inspired me to get into science and technology. And I think it was kind of a combination of, of nature and nurture. Uh, I think they passed along some of their natural inquisitive nature. So I quickly became one of those kids that was always asking questions, you know, the how and why type questions. Um, and, and, you know, I, I realized fairly easily and quickly because of exposure to science and technology that that was a great way to sort of provide a, a nice framework for answering those questions and eventually actually pursuing a career and and taking that knowledge and applying it in a way that hopefully made some sense. But ironically, um, while they inspired me towards science and technology, I, I had really no initial aspirations of working in a paint company. So I had no desire to literally go into the, the family business that way, but absolutely wanted to pursue science and technology. Are you still asking questions today about how does this work? Why is this? Why is that? Is that kind of what the role of a scientist is doing in mobility? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And that's really the role of scientists broadly. There's a lot of different scientific disciplines, but there's some basic fundamentals of science and technology that translate well. So science, you know, whether it's chemistry, which, you know, officially I have some kind of qualifications in, whether it's physics, which is something that I like to play with, um, even some aspects of social sciences. Um, there, there's a basic kind of construct in which you're constantly asking questions, thinking about what might be testing those hypotheses. Um, and then from that learning, hopefully you're able to do something useful with it. So, um, so yeah, I, it's, it's, it's not diminished at all. It's uh, one of these things that, that only increases with every moment. Uh, the types of questions change, the types of problems that I might be interested in solving with, uh, with answering those questions changes. But, uh, but the fundamentals still there. Today, you're asking more complex questions, doing more complex uh, research, reading longer, longer books, graduated from the smaller books to the, to the big volume books to kind of expand your knowledge? Uh, yeah, and, and some of that knowledge gathering is, is you know, reading. Um, we actually had a great conversation earlier about the, the incredible availability of knowledge now, you know, with some of the information technology changes that, that have come along in the last few years and that we're embracing. And, you know, where previously you used to go to the library, get a book, learn formally, or you would have, you know, long discussions with, um, with individuals, with mentors, with experts within a given area uh, to be able to expand your knowledge. Now we have so much knowledge that's just readily available to us. And, you know, thanks IT, um, you know, a form of technology for making that available to us. For one of our listeners describes to this always learning philosophy, and might not be familiar with the inner workings of the paintings and coatings industry. Would you be so kind to kind of share a high level overview of the industry and its impact on society? Oh yeah, I would, I would absolutely love to, uh, you know, for me, you mentioned earlier that, you know, for me, coatings are kind of a fascinating topic. Um, paint I feel has developed this kind of bad rap. I, I frequently hear the phrase, you know, it's about as exciting as watching paint dry. And I love watching paint dry because there's so much that we can learn from that. Um, and, you know, paint has become extremely ubiquitous. We don't always recognize, but paints and coatings absolutely surround us pretty much every point of the, of the day, um, wherever we are in the world. Um, sometimes we recognize it, sometimes we don't, but, um, you know, they, they, they're utilized in a lot of different ways to provide uh, decoration. You know, that's something that we certainly recognize as, as I look at, you know, the walls around me. Uh, there's obviously some choices that I've made for color or finish from a decorative perspective. Another big part of the job that coatings do on, on a broad range of different applications is protection. 
Um, things like protecting metal structures from rusting. So that could be your car, it could be an aircraft, um, it could be a building structure, um, a lot of different places where that's going to be important. And then one of the areas that you know continues to really excite me because it's just expanding so, so greatly um, is that coatings are bringing a variety of different functionalizations. So, you know, different functions beyond decoration and protection that, that we sometimes don't even recognize are there, but make our lives a little bit better. So, you know, just as an example, I have my cell phone sitting in front of me and this particular cell phone, I really like the way that it feels when I touch it. You know, my finger glides very smoothly over the touch surface. The touch surface works because of coatings. It doesn't scratch because of coatings. That nice feel that gives me the pleasure when I'm working with it is because of coating. So these are some aspects of functionality that when you look at it, you don't see it. You don't necessarily see there's a coating there. Uh, and more and more that surrounds us. And we just, if it's doing its job well, you don't even recognize that it's there. You bring up a really valid point around coatings. And Apple had the new iPad announcement yesterday. And, oh, we have this new A12 chip, this new chip. It's, it's faster. It's this. But you brought up the good point. The average consumer doesn't interact with the chip on a daily basis. It, it, it runs in the background, but they touch the coding every day. How many times an individual touches their iPhone every day? Why do you think that these large consumer brands haven't talked about the value of the coatings or the improvement of the coatings to make the functionality of the phones better? Some have. Um, some have decided to focus on that and some have not you know with with many of the brands there's a decision to really focus on kind of clean pure materials and so you don't always want to talk about the fact that there's some of these things on top of these pure clean materials in other cases um, the brands are certainly talking about the differentiation there you know just a, one example of that is if we think back not too long ago you know if, if you dropped your phone into water that was a problem. Um, you know, nowadays there's there's coatings on the interior surfaces and there's coatings around some of the uh, the kind of ceiling areas that really protect the operation of the phone if you drop them into water. So that that's one area where people are advertising. You know, they're they're now talking about the fact that your phone can survive being in a meter of water, five meters of water, uh, whatever's appropriate there. Still, don't recommend that you do it, but. Uh, but it works if you do it by accident. I remember years ago at CES, I forget the consumer brand that was showing off a phone and they had it in a fish tank. And so the, the, uh, they're like, oh, we closed all the ports and all the holes, but you're saying that that was mainly a coatings breakthrough that allowed that to happen? Um, it depends on which year at CES. So uh, when, when the industry was first starting to address this challenge, um, they decided to go forward with a, a design solution, you know, bringing in some gasketing type materials. And, um, and that worked to some extent, um, but there, you know, there was cost penalties associated with doing that. Um, there was also some performance challenges associated with doing that. And so coming forward with a coating solution actually uh, it was a better mousetrap. It was a better way to solve the problem. It was a much more cost effective way to solve the problem. Um, and, and that's good for everybody. Coatings are having a positive impact on society. They're having a positive impact on individuals that use a cell phone every day. And let's and paint also has a positive impact on our society. It makes things colorful. It makes things joyful. And recently, PPG worked with Bentley Motors to recreate the 1920s paint color for the Bentley blower, which broke several 24 hours of Le Mans records in 1930. Will you please kindly talk about how PPG was able to bring this iconic car back to a beautiful, colorful life? Yeah, yeah. What, what a fun project to talk about, especially for a scientist, because most of my time I'm looking forward. You know, I'm thinking about how we we, uh, we capture the future rather than restoring the past. But this is a great example of how we were able to bring those two aspects together. So, um, you know, Bentley has embarked on a couple of programs where they're recreating some iconic vehicles. In this particular case, it was, uh, you know, a vehicle that was used on a racing team, classic British racing green came into play here. And um, so they made a decision to actually rebuild to the original specifications uh, about a dozen or so of these vehicles. And uh, they wanted to make sure that as close as possible, they could reproduce the paint that was used. And so what we were able to do was not only come in with a great color match, but actually match the finish. So make it look like the paint would have looked 90 or so years ago 
but using modern technology that allows us to still bring today's benefits in terms of corrosion performance, durability, and a lot of things that just weren't available 90 years ago. So it was a perfect way of bringing the future to the past in a way that captured all the nostalgia, but, but brought all the benefits of today. Was there one of the original vehicles that you brought into the lab, or was this all done from archival photos? Like, I'm really curious. You matched the finish. You, the product looked absolutely gorgeous. But how, how, how was that done? Yeah, so there, there's actually a number of different ways that, that we can do that. Um, we, we've got quite a lot of technology that's available to us that allows us to measure and characterize. A big part of what we do in science is measuring and characterizing things. So in this case, we could measure and characterize the color um, and also the, the kind of surface uniformity that was on the original coating. Um, and then we know how to recreate that just through some of our standard tools that we have. So to a, you know, a pretty great extent, we've, we've had for some time that ability to take a color anywhere and match it in a, in a paint. And again, you know, you talked about some of my, um, my introduction to paint from, from childhood memories. I, I can remember my father coming home when I was a child with a, a candy wrapper that was this really bright, purple kind of metallic finish candy wrapper and kind of holding it up and saying we match this in wall paint today and there's a lot of questions about why you would want to match that color in wall paint <laughs> but um but you know he was he was quite proud that you know even back many years ago that was something that we could do back in those days they did it with a, a skilled technician who you know would use their eye and be able to kind of blend these things uh, based on on feel and experience and, and, um, and, um, you know, just the, the art, if you like, of color matching. Nowadays we can do it much more rapidly, much more accurately with a lot of, uh, equipment to help us. I think it's absolutely wonderful. And frankly, I think it's awesome that you still remember that story of color matching from your childhood. Yeah, <laughs> I can still see his face. That's wonderful and special. And, and and it just it it says that you know you lived a colorful life. I love color. I like bright pinks and pastels, but a majority of the consumers in North America, South America, Europe, and Asia overwhelmingly prefer white, black, gray, and silver cars over colorful ones. Why do you think that is? Yeah, that that that's absolutely true. Um, and there's actually really good reason. There's a few good reasons that that that's the case. Um, you know, as we take a look at the general area of, of, of color, color science is kind of fascinating. Um, one of the things that I like about it is it's very interdisciplinary. So to really understand how to manage color, you've got to understand the physics of color, the chemistry of color. You've got to understand the biology and neuroscience behind how the eye works and how you, you know, your brain perceives color. And then specifically to the questions that you're asking, which is a color preference thing, then you're getting into the psychology and sociology of color. So because of the way that our eyes work and our brains work, um, we tend to have a very emotional response to color. So color is a very personal thing and there's, it absolutely generates uh, an emotional response from people. Um, as we think about bright colors and what we would typically describe as color, so those hues that are blues, greens, yellows, you know, vibrant colors, uh, you can easily think of some specific kind of emotional responses in terms of energy, adventure, you know, passion that you can associate with some of those. Right in the middle of that kind of color space, the way um, we work are, is a color, it's like a stretch of neutral colors, and that's our blacks, our grays, our silvers, or whites. So they also create kind of an emotional response, but it tends to be a much more um, standard response. So, you know, it, it, it talks about strength. It talks about um, practicality. It talks about simplicity. And so that resonates with, with everybody at any given point in time. And because it's so kind of universal in the way that it re reacts with people, um, it's become very much core in the offering of all the vehicles that are out there. So it plays very well across a number of different vehicle types, vehicle designs, works well across a broad range of brands. And as a result, everybody carries those colors. So that in itself kind of pushes people in that particular direction. 
Uh, one of the other reasons is, is, is you know, also quite practical. Um, some of the, the trends that we see in color preferences will vary depending on, again, the interplay of emotions. So sometimes our color stylists will kind of try and enhance an emotion. Other times they'll try and counteract emotion. And so those obviously change a little bit with what's going on in the world. They'll change regionally to some extent. Um, and so that, that also means that those trends tend to move around. They vary with time, they vary with region. Um, and so when somebody goes to make a car purchase, some portion of the public are very comfortable embracing, you know, that emotional reaction they have with a particular color, a particular design. For others, again, that practical aspect clicks in. Gray is very practical. <laughs> so there's the tendency to kind of default. I'm spending many tens of thousands of dollars. I'm going to get that thing that I'm going to still like many years from now. And that's really become quite important when we consider that you know, nowadays, I think the average age of the car on the road right now is something like 16 years. So, um, you know, if you're going to hold a car for 16 years, certainly those core colors are going to continue to be relevant, whereas some of the brighter colors may, you know, move with the trends. That's really fascinating insight into colors. And I am a blue color uh, car guy. I've been a blue color car guy for a long time and doing research for this podcast. I realize there's only 7.5% of consumers globally that prefer blue cars. So what does that say about me? <laughs> that I'm so far in that minority. <laughs> oh, so don't think of yourself in the minority because if, if you take those core colors we talked about and take them out of the picture, um, then what you see is that really blues and reds are both the next most popular ones. And so blue, blue's been consistently a popular color. Um, you know, again, we talk about the types of of emotions that, that are normally generated. So, you know, think about the phrase true blue. That's something that broadly resonates. I think a lot of people understand that. Blue is a color that you associate with trust, with loyalty, with competence, even with peace to some extent. And so th that, that's, a, that's a very enduring set of features. And that's one of the reasons that blue has always been fairly popular. And then if we think about, you know, some of what we're dealing with in the world at the moment, this is a, an unusual time. Um, you know, what, what's normal is kind of being reset um, at this point. Uh, there, there's a lot of desire for that kind of peace and calming nature that comes with blue. And we've already seen an uptick in actually the preference towards blue. So as we look at our most recent numbers, we see that the blue is actually creeping back up, you know, particularly in Europe and North America. It's, it's, it's moved up almost 50% relative to where it was before. So blue is a good color, true blue. Hey, and blue is PPG's corporate color, so we're all about true blue. Oh, good. So then we share the trust, loyalty, and confidence together. So between PPG and myself, we're in good shape. <laughs> I hope we are in great shape. Today, when, you're, when your average consumer goes to buy a car, they're going to buy a vehicle most likely – I would say nine out of 10 times or eight out of 10 times with an internal combustion engine, but there is a clear shift in society towards electric vehicles. For the consumers that are buying an electric vehicle versus a vehicle with an ICE engine, are those different paintings and coatings? Because the, to me, the ICE engine can get hot where the electric vehicle doesn't have that many moving parts, plus it has a, a battery on the bottom. Can you share any insight in the paintings and coatings between an ICE engine and an electric vehicle, please? Oh yeah, I would absolutely love to. This this is an area that um, certainly has a lot of my my focus at this point in time. The, the very short answer to the question is that the the, the coatings are changing. They're changing necessarily. Um, now, the the longer answer to the question is we, we see some of the standard coatings that are being utilized today still being necessary with this shift in the drivetrain. So certainly, we want to continue to you know, decorate and protect the body panels, make sure that we've got good um, resistance to rust, good resistance to the elements. You know, if we're, if we're in an area that's got a high level of sun exposure, that we can continue to manage that well enough. So um, to a great extent with electrification, those are going to continue to be in play. With the shift in the drivetrain, it actually opens up an abundance of new problems that coatings are really well set up to solve. Um, so I, I don't re recommend that you do this, but if you were to take apart 
the battery pack um, assembly within an electric vehicle, what you'll very quickly realize is that there are lots of components. Um, in the simplest of designs, there's hundreds of components. Um, in some particular designs out there, there's literally almost 10,000 components that are in there. And those components have a lot of surfaces. And a lot of those surfaces have some very specific and unique requirements that, again, if you think about what you do with a, a paint and a coating, you're putting it on a surface. So um, that, that's a lot of new surfaces with a lot of new challenges and new problems that, that we're designing specific coatings to help with. And so some of the traditional problems I've talked about, you know, continue through. Less concern about the decoration within the battery assembly, you know, because you're not really going to see it. Although, believe it or not, we still do actually make sure that we hit some, some appearance standards so that if ever things do uh, get taken apart, they're still going to look great, you know, whether or not the consumer is ever going to really have the opportunity to look at them. Uh, but the protection side of it absolutely is in play. Um, there's really a lot of challenges that we're seeing the industry trying to manage right now around safety, around performance, and then again, around manufacturability. And so coatings play very, very well there. On the safety side, there's some key things that we want to make sure happen to keep a battery operating safely. So some of these battery systems today are actually running at about 400, 600 volts. You know, they're in that kind of range. There's uh, an industry roadmap to continue to push to higher and higher voltages. There's some key benefits and efficiencies that happen when you can actually get there in other parts of the drivetrain. Uh, it also makes it easier for some of the fast charging and, and enabling things that, um, that the industry is working on to try and make it much easier to make the shift to an electric vehicle. Um, so very, very high voltages. We want to make sure that those components are electrically separated from other components and obviously electrically separated from people. Um, and so this, this presents a lot of opportunities for bringing in dielectric materials. And so traditionally the industry's managed dielectric materials with, with dielectric and just for everybody in case they're not familiar with the term, dielectric basically just means it's electrically insulating. So you're not able to pass electricity through, it keeps it electrically separated. So traditionally, the industry has, has looked at dielectric materials such as tapes and films, um, but they're also recognizing that there's some inherent weaknesses with those types of approaches, and they're quite difficult to scale, you know, particularly as you are starting to move from a, a relatively small number of electric vehicle builds to a very large number. You want to make sure that your manufacturing is very quick, very efficient, uh, very robust. Um, I, I'm sure you're just using your imagination if you've got a three-dimensional part and you're trying to wrap it with tape and make sure that it's all consistently done, you can instantly recognize the challenge that's going to be associated with that. Whereas spraying a paint on um, conforms you know, very readily to all of those surfaces and provides a very, very high level of electrical protection and additionally, it's super easy to scale up. So, you know, painting is something that we can do in industrial scale and do do an industrial scale in a lot of other places. So, you know, that that's one example. There's a whole host of other examples. I won't go through the same detail in all of them, but, you know, coatings can provide fire protection so that if there is actually something that goes wrong, if there's a crash or there's a puncture of the battery pack, um, you know, we see some images in the media uh, that when electric vehicles do catch fire, it can be quite an aggressive fire. And so, you know, believe it or not, we can use a coating which gets applied as a very thin coating layer. So it goes on just like a, a regular thin paint. And if everything's working perfectly, it just stays like a regular thin paint and, you know, doesn't, doesn't take up any space, doesn't add a lot of weight, you know, doesn't really do anything. But if there is an event like a fire, when these coatings get to a certain temperature, they, they change very, very rapidly. They actually become quite thick. They become quite insulating and they're able to protect the, the structure of the battery to stop the fire from you know, spreading um, either within the battery assembly or, or worse still out of the assembly into the vehicle itself. And just to give you some sense of the temperatures we're talking about, 
that's 1600 to 2000 Celsius. So it's, it's quite hot, uh, hot enough that the metals would ordinarily melt. So, you know, we're able to use the, use paint to keep a very, very hot, very aggressive fire inside a metal box and protect the metal box. Let's stay on the temperature theme here. And I want to give you a hypothetical earlier uh, this year. We recorded the hottest temperature ever in the in the world in the Death Valley, over 120 degrees. I'm in an electric vehicle cruising through the Mojave Desert in Death Valley. It's over 120 degrees. How is the battery not catching on fire from all the heat from the asphalt, the heat from the battery? Is that coatings that allows that to go into that really extreme environment? Well, the, the good news is at that temperature, it's not going to catch on fire. But at that temperature, there's a lot of other concerns for the for the electric vehicle maker. Um, one of the things that I, I didn't fully appreciate until maybe five, six years ago when I started learning more about lithium ion batteries is they, um, they have a fairly narrow operating temperature window. So they really work best, you know, within a few tens of degrees around what we would normally think of as room temperature. You, you get too far above that and some chemistry can happen inside the battery, um, which is irreversible and actually shortens the lifetime of the battery. It gets too cold and things just kind of get sluggish. Um, you know, it's difficult to move the, the lithium ions well enough, which means it's difficult to move the electrons. So some of the performance uh, begins to drop off. Um, and so the industry is working extremely hard to make sure that no matter what temperature it is outside, you know, whether you're Arctic, very sub-zero temperatures, or whether you're in the situation you just described where you, you want to drive across Death Valley at, at what feels like an unreasonably high temperature, the, the battery cells themselves are being maintained within that ideal working window. So the, the battery pack assembly as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of different components. Many of those components are the battery cells themselves, but there's a lot of other stuff in there. Um, some of that stuff uh, makes up the, uh, the battery thermal management system. So basically, it's like a heat exchanger, and there's different designs that are in play. But it's a heat exchanger so that you're able to maintain that consistent temperature in the battery no matter what's happening outside. And, um, and I'm, I'm glad you took me down this path because absolutely coatings can, can play a role there. Um, the actual heat exchanger components, the cooling plates, they again have to be electrically separated. So what I talked about previously with dielectric coatings comes into play. You know, as you're cycling these materials, if there's moisture and humidity, you want to minimize that within the battery pack, but you know, you, you've got to prepare for the worst case. Um, then again, you could get condensation, so corrosion uh, becomes important there too. But you know, one of the areas that we're just delighted to um, to bring some solutions is making sure that that the heat can move very easily between those components. So if you if you think about um, this situation where you've got a hot battery cell and you've got this cooling plate. Then if you bring them up in contact with each other, you're going to be able to transfer heat from the hot thing to the cold thing. And that's that's what you want to do. Um, if you look really, really, really closely at that interface between those two components, there's microscopic air gaps. And that's just, you know, we're not... We, we're not at the stage where we perfectly machine all these components so that they're atomically smooth. It would be not cost effective to do that at all. So we make them visually smooth, but those, those microscopic air gaps uh, make it very difficult to move heat. Air is a fantastic insulator. And even that thin, thin layer of air you know, can, can really make a, a, a difference in the performance of the, the heat management system. And so um, we've also developed a range of different materials that, that basically fill that gap. Um, so thermal gap fillers, as the name would suggest, are really designed to do that. Um, so it's, um, it, it's, it's thicker than a standard coating in some applications. Um, but again, like a coating, it's very easy to scale it. We can apply it robotically. It's something that when we go to mass manufacturing, uh, is very, very similar to some other materials that we do in mass manufacturing for the automotive industry today. And I love this 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 conversation that started off early when you talked about your childhood of, of always learning and always asking questions because I feel like I'm getting an absolute 
awesome deep dive on paintings and coatings as it relates to mobility. We've had an incredible deep dive around batteries and, and coatings and paints. And then the next evolution that's going to happen in mobility, as you're well aware, is autonomous vehicles. So now we've, we've done an, an always learning deep dive on batteries. What about on the, in the top part of the vehicle from the paint and coatings of an autonomous vehicle that's going to run hundreds of thousands of miles without going for change? Will those paints or coatings change versus a traditional electric vehicle or a traditional ice vehicle that will be driven 30,000 miles and changed in for when they turn their lease in for a new car? Will those paintings and coatings be more durable and be able to take, I guess, I don't know if this is the right word to use, but I'll say it more impact or abuse than a traditional lease vehicle? Yeah, so I, I hope when we get to autonomous vehicles that the impact problem is actually moving in the opposite direction. <laughs> um, wh what I would say absolutely is those coatings are going to evolve. And, and it gets quite interesting because, you know, very often we design the, the durability of a coating, you know, to a couple of the, the, the points that you raised. Um, the, the durability of the coating um, to be durable for a period of time. Um, we're seeing potentially a big shift where we think about the life cycle of these assets less being measured in time and more being measured in mileage. And so, um, you know, I, I forget what the exact number is, but it, my understanding is that a typical um, commuter will drive less than 40 miles a day round trip. Um, so they're doing 40 miles overall, you know, that's split over, you know, some reasonably short period of time when you look at the whole day. So let's just imagine that's, that's an hour or so, depending on where you are. It could be three hours, I guess, with the traffic patterns. But we'll just say you're using the vehicle for about an hour a day. So the rest of the time, it's kind of sitting there. It could be exposed to elements. So we want to make sure that while it's sitting outside over that period of time, you know, it's protected for the whole time it's out there, but it's really only being driven 40 miles being used for an hour. As we move to autonomous vehicles and we start to look at that really lining up with some of the mobility services where those autonomous vehicles are going to be used more as shared assets. All of a sudden, those vehicles could be used 23 hours a day and then, you know, charge back up, reflect, refresh, cleaned, you know, whatever needs to happen for, for the other hour. Um, so suddenly you're driving a lot more miles, but the actual lifetime is, is going to be more relevantly measured in miles rather than time outside. So I, I don't think we'll get to the stage where we back off and make it less durable from a time in the environment perspective. But there's some things that we absolutely need to think about in terms of where and how much time it's actually in use. And to some extent, that'll impact the exterior. We definitely expect it's going to impact the interior, you know, because the interior um, is, again, going to be used 23 hours of the day instead of, of one hour of the day. And so those surfaces are, are absolutely going to have to be you know, very cleanable, very easily, um, or, or stain resistant. We're going to need to make sure that they're, they're very robust to wear. Um, and, you know, potentially that they're also just easier for the, the occupants to, you know, interact with the world around them because, you know, again, we're talking about a, an autonomous vehicle scenario. So we're not thinking so much about what the driver's doing in the vehicle. We're thinking about what a passenger's doing in the vehicle. And I assume they're going to be using that time to do something other than focusing on the road and making sure that they're, they're keeping the car going in the right direction and not hitting the car in front of them. I, I want to dive into interiors, but before we, we get there, I've been thinking a lot about uh, autonomous vehicles and the, the elements and the environments they run in. If you're an autonomous vehicle service in the middle of winter in Chicago and you've got that wind coming off of Lake Michigan, and all that salt on the road, is that a different coating versus um, an autonomous vehicle that's running in Phoenix where it's very dry that time of the year in the winter and, and the climate is not as harsh? And does the coatings are, so those vehicles can last longer when that salt's hitting them and that wind's hitting them and pecking away at the paint? But do you PPG invent something that say, hey, don't worry, Chicago wind, you're not going to ruin our paint. <laughs> the fun challenge for, for a coatings company like PPG is we don't know where the vehicle's actually going to be used. And as you take a look at the way the industry's, you know, um, evolving, um, 
manufacturers are producing you know different builds in different parts of the world they could be shipped anywhere so not only could we be dealing with it being in one part of the US versus another part of the US if it's made in the US, but that vehicle could have been made in Europe and then shipped to the US, could be made in the US and shipped to China. Things can move around all, all, all over. And that's just the reality of, of where we are and the way that the industry is working. So that means that you take all those extreme challenges that you talked about. So, if, you know, the, the extreme sun exposure in Arizona, um, getting abrasive winds coming off lakes in certain places, uh, ocean coastal areas where there's a lot of salt that's involved in the spray that's coming in. And we need to make sure that the coatings can hold up to all of those because we just don't know where the vehicle's going to go. Um, so I, I would say that's going to continue to be in play, whether it's an autonomous vehicle or an ICE vehicle. So not so many changes there. But with the autonomous vehicles coming in, you know, we, we do see some new challenges. So um, think about those same questions, but, but maybe a little bit differently from the, the, the durability of the paint to those environments. With autonomous vehicles, we've now got a whole series of new sensors that are going to be involved. So a, a number of different sensors typically used in combination to provide the information that the vehicle needs on the environment around so that it can actually drive autonomously. And, um, and, and many of those are, are obviously in test and some of them are in play today, you know, with lower levels of autonomy that, we, that we're now starting to almost take for granted as some of our, our ADAS features that we would see. Um, so we're learning a lot about what's going to be really required for those sensors to work absolutely all the time, no flaws, no issues and recognizing with that that the coatings for other reasons will necessarily have to evolve a little bit. Um, so, you know, just to give you an example, things like adaptive cruise control are, are, you know, fairly commonly in use already today. There's some legislation that's coming through that radars are used, you know, to make sure that there's uh, braking systems um, in, in many places. And so the, the radar technology that's utilized there is already performing a lot of different functions. As we think about adapting that to how we would want to use that as part of the information packet for, um, for an autonomous vehicle, then we've really got to think about the data integrity and how the coating can impact that. So, you know, coming back to those scenarios, if you've got wind that's bringing in dust and dirt, that can build up in front of the, the painted surface that the radar sits behind. Um, snow, ice, you know, there's, there's all kinds of things that can come in that can actually build up and to some extent obscure the, the vision of, um, of the sensor, um, whether it's using radar, whether it's using light, uh, visible light or invisible light to be able to do that. And so yeah, we're absolutely working on a number of coatings that um, can be more transmissive to the appropriate wavelengths that are in play. Again, visible some cases, infrared in other cases, radar in other cases. Um, and we also wanna make sure that we can keep those coated surfaces clean. Um, and, and that actually takes us to some really fun things that we get to do where we're, we're, we're simulating bug pickup. You know, you've, you've got to be able to understand how easy it is to not just get some environmental dust and dirt off a vehicle, but, um, but some fairly persistent bugs when you drive through certain parts of the world that can really quickly foul um, traditional surfaces. Um, and, and so... You know, we're, we're even looking at, at coatings that will help the stop the bugs from sticking in the first place. Um, and if that doesn't work perfectly, then at least make it much easier so that if you if it rains, it'll wash it off or you can hose it off without you know too much work or effort to be able to clean it up. Um, so there's, yeah, there's a real kind of evolution of those traditional coatings to make sure that the sensors can work well and ensure that the autonomous systems are actually performing safely. Is there a special type of coating that goes on the radar to ensure optimal functionality? And so if you have a bug or dirt or something, is there a special type of coating that will 
make it fall away or, or melt away to ensure that that radar is always working? Um, so we, we, we certainly have some prototypes and testing um, that I can't get into too many details of. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's absolutely an area that we're focused on is making sure that, that we can um, prevent any type of fouling, whether it's bugs, whether it's just general dirt from driving through a, a you know, dirty environment, a muddy environment, um, and even things like the release of, of snow. Um, and things as simple as just ensuring that the way rain comes off that surface is in a very consistent and controlled manner. Because um, rain, you wouldn't think about it, but rain can have you know a little bit of an impact on what the radar sees. So that that's part of the challenge there. You know, the other challenge, um, if if we go kind of loop all the way back to an earlier conversation, you know, we talked about really popular colors, and one of those very popular core colors is silver. So you know, radar is kind of interesting because the the, the radar energy um, can be pass through certain materials, it can be reflected by certain materials, it can be absorbed by certain materials. And so if, if you have a, a coating system and a part that's actually sitting in front of the, the radar unit, um, you want to make sure that it is as transparent as possible. You want to be able to send the signal out and then once the signal comes back, not have it obscured by um, the, the, the panel or the coating or anything that's in front of it. So, yeah, silver, very popular color. Um, you know, the way that, that normally we produce a silver color is by putting metal flake actually into the paint. Metal is not radar transparent. So, um, so you know, one of, the, one of the other areas that the industry broadly and PPG specifically is, is actively working on is ensuring that we can continue to provide those very, very popular colors um, and do it in a way that the cars still look great, but some of these new um, expectations around the functionality of the sensors can be met safely all the time, anytime. What about LIDARs? Are there special types of things that have to go into the paints or, or the coatings for LIDARs to function at full capacity? Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> that, that, that's another area where there's there's a lot of, of opportunities. So uh, and if you really kind of dissect a lidar, then you know I, again you're you're sending a, a pulse of of light out, and um and you're you're measuring what comes back. And so you know just as we talked about with radar, you want to make sure that things don't foul in front of the sensor. So some of the the easy clean or self cleaning. Um, or anti-fouling coatings that, that we just talked about certainly come into play there. Um, you also want to make sure that that you're maximizing the the light that you want to transmit and you're minimizing any stray light. And so there's actually some coatings that can help with that, that can help kind of uh, absorb unwanted light and make sure that it doesn't uh, interfere with the sensor on the way back. And, and then you know, something else that, that we've certainly got the capability to do is influence how visible objects are to a LiDAR. So you've obviously got to make sure that if you're using a LiDAR, it can kind of see everything and anything. Uh, but one of the things that we recognized fairly early on that we could do is, you know, take some colors that traditionally would be difficult to detect by LiDAR and make them super easy to detect by LiDAR, but still keep them looking the same color. So if I go for the, the example of, of black. So black is black to our eyes because it does a great job of, of absorbing all the visible light. It also does a super good job, typically the way that we, we make a black coating, of absorbing the near infrared wavelengths that are utilized by a LiDAR. So that means if, if the LiDAR is looking out, it's, uh, it, it's not necessarily easy to be able to see a, a black object because there's not too much light that's coming back from that black object, you know, the, the LiDAR signals being absorbed. So, you know, for, for other reasons, we've developed a great skill set around decoupling different parts of the electromagnetic radiation spectrum. Um, so basically, we can we can separate what's happening in visible light wavelengths that 
for us would be perceived as color um, from what's happening at, at ultraviolet wavelengths, which is really good for controlling durability and things like that. Um, and we can also separate that from near infrared wavelengths. And that's, that's very useful for a number of different factors. It's something that we've uh, employed across a number of industries, including the aerospace industry, actually to keep dark painted objects cool. So, you know, as, as an example there, um, you know, many modern aircraft for weight savings reasons are, have, have kind of uh, moved to more and more use of carbon fiber. Um, carbon fiber doesn't inherently spread heat all that well by its nature. That's one thing that the traditional material, aluminum, aluminium, depending on how you want to say it, did a much better job of kind of, um, of moving that. And so if you paint part of an aircraft with a dark color, you've got to make sure that it doesn't heat up beyond a certain point. You don't want to compromise the structure of the material. You don't want things to expand a little bit more in the dark areas than the light areas. Um, things like that. And so we've been able to help that industry by making a range of colors, any color you want, dark colors, um, by ensuring that at these infrared wavelengths, they're very, very reflective. So effectively, it looks like white or close to white at infrared wavelengths, but in the, the visible region, it's whatever color you, you desire it to be. And that's something we actually leverage from nature. Um, no, I, again, I, I've said it a few times, you know, science, really an awful lot of science problems are solved at kind of the interfaces of different disciplines. And so as in a very unrelated area, scientists understood why an eggplant stays cool when it sits out on a hot, sunny day, even though it's, it's a, a dark aubergine color. Um, once we understood how that worked, we were able to bring that technology forward and keep dark colored aircraft and cars and buildings also from, from heating up. And those same principles have really allowed us to very quickly make um, objects very, very visible to LIDAR, no matter what color they are too. So there's two themes that have, have emerged throughout this podcast is the, the always learning and always exploring of looking at new things. And that paint and coatings are not just make the world colorful and pretty, they're functional. And they, they do a really, really, really good job of being functional. When we look at the the urban environments of today, there's a common trend around the cities around the world of scooter, scooter, scooters. And they, uh, let, let's put it this way, they're, they're not used very gently. Are those different types of paintings, uh, paint and coatings, um, to make them so they function optimally they're, since they're going through this really rough environment? Uh, um, so yes, the answer is yes. Um, and you wouldn't necessarily recognize that just by looking at it because at first glance, again, you see you see a coating that's, that's protecting typically the metal structures of, of the scooter um, and that's providing, you know, some kind of decoration. And, you know, the other nice thing there is that um, with a lot of these fleet scooters that are out there, uh, you know, they're, they're obviously all moving towards brand colors. So it's a way of identifying brands. So that's, that's absolutely what the paint has to do. But the functionality piece, it's, it's funny that you bring that up. It really is critical. Um, yeah, these are not handled gently. And so we've been able, again, to take some learnings from other industries where um, toughness, impact resistance, scratch resistant is really important and leverage that in the particular coating systems that we bring forward for things like scooters. We see that with scooters, we see it with these kind of fleet fleet bicycles, whether it's a, an e-bike or a, a conventional pedal bike that's now used in fleet. And then the other thing that, that you know some of those brand owners are doing is in addition to making sure that the color really does a great job of identifying their brand there's functionality in the color too so the, the you know the story that i just told you about making objects very visible to lidar um I, I can tell you that fleet owners are thinking about that right now so they're actually ensuring that that some of these types of, of fleet personal use vehicles whether it's a scooter or an e-bike or a conventional bike 
are going to be very, very detectable with the new technologies that are coming through. So yeah, there's a lot of functionality that if you didn't know it was there, you would never know it was there, but it's, it's keeping you safe and it's, um, and it's keeping the asset in much better shape for you. And it's a benefit to both societies. When you look to the future of mobility, how do you see the paints and coating industry uh, evolving to keep up with all these new emerging trends that are starting to bubble up? Um, with big smiles on our faces. <laughs> That's an awesome answer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the, the really nice thing here is many of these challenges that we're seeing um, are, are new to this specific application. But because paints and coatings are used on so many different things in so many different industries, in most cases, we've already solved the problem somewhere else. So it's, it's thinking about how we can connect and adapt that solution and then bring it very forward into this new, you know, very, or very quickly forward, sorry, into this new application. That, that's really the, the critical thing there. So I, I kind of love it because it gives us an opportunity to take some learnings from some places that you would never associate with this new use in mobility. Um, and, and solve a whole brand new set of problems. This has been really insightful, deep dive around paints and, and coatings. And just frankly, I love to learn. And so this has been like a masterclass in paints and coating. So thank you uh, for this. And, and thank you to our listeners for, for listening. And as we look to wrap up this conversation, I, I'd like to ask you this, this one last question. Growing up in a household of scientists, how do we get more children interested in, in science and technology? You were very lucky, but a lot of these children don't have that exposure that you've had as a child. What can we do to get them more interested uh, in STEM? I, I think um, one of the things we can do is, is, is really to make some of the connections that science and technology is pretty much everywhere. Um, you know, very often we think about it in, in specific disciplines, like, oh, I'm going to learn chemistry, that means I can only do chemistry, or oh, I'm going to become a physicist, that means I can only do physics. Um, that's absolutely not the case. Uh, you learn some basics that are very portable from how you want to use it, where you want to use it across a, a broad number of industries. And it really applies in places that you wouldn't necessarily think. So I, I think if we can help make some of those connections so that they recognize there's a lot of different disciplines from or science, you know, pick the one that resonates with you most to get started with, but there's a good chance that that base information is gonna let you broadly, broadly travel. And I've absolutely lived that. You know, I might have, I might have started off with exposure to pain and ended up in pain, but I've done a lot of different things on my journey through there. I mean, I really studied as a forensic scientist. You know, I applied some of what I learned um, as a forensic scientist in some fairly interesting opportunities that I had before I came back into paint. Um, and then with paint, you know, even though I may be a chemist by training, on any given day, I'm more thinking about the psychology, I'm more thinking about the biology, I'm more thinking about, you know, a lot of these other aspects that not only allow me to solve better problems for the world, um, but it gives me a chance to learn and kind of move my skill set in, in different directions. So it's, it's extremely portable and it ends up helping you in a lot of branches that you wouldn't necessarily think about. You know, learn math, you can be a whiz kid on Wall Street. It's not an obvious connection in there, but you you know you take a look at what you know where the the Wall Street hirers are focusing, and it's a lot of the math and physics guys because an awful lot of predicting the unpredictable nature of human beings can be managed and better predicted using good math, good physics principles. Learning and curiosity are two of the most wonderful things that you can in, embed into a child. And Callum, I, I thank you so much for coming on the podcast because as we've heard. Uh, from you is that paintings and coatings have an extremely positive impact on society. And thank you for being so generous with your time and sharing this incredible wealth of knowledge with us. So thank you again. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you for listening to SAE's Tomorrow Today podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, please kindly rate it, share your feedback. We love comments and subscribe. 
on your favorite podcast platform. For more information on SAE and SAE podcasts, be sure to visit sae.org forward slash podcast and follow SAE on social media at SAEINTL on Twitter and Instagram and at SAE International on Facebook and LinkedIn. SAE International makes no representations as to the accuracy of the information presented in this podcast. The information and opinions are for general information only. SAE International does not endorse, approve, recommend, or certify any information, product, process, service, or organization presented or mentioned in this podcast.